I'm okay. I spent like an hour debugging this shit this morning, which was really irritating. That's why I showed up late to this. So I was like. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm going to be talking about really easy binary exploitation. This is like kind of baby level stuff. But if it's new to you, don't be uh, discouraged because I learned about this like two years ago. Uh, so I'm Joe Graham. I do the uh, networking stuff here, especially for like ISTS and IRSEC and shit. Um, I'm the CCDC assistant coach, I'm a certified penetration tester, and a formerly certified entry level network technician, but then that uh, expired. Um, and I am a fan of offensive security. Uh, so really quick, I'm going to go over a bunch of terms, because as I was writing this, I realized some of you guys haven't taken like anything beyond intro to Java and stuff like that. Uh, so first and foremost, a binary is just another name for the programs that you run on your computer box. Uh, Windows uses a .exe, it's a packed executable, uh, while, whereas Linux uses what's called an ELF. Uh, I don't remember what that stands for. These basically just mean how is everything arranged within the program and loaded. Hector, you're going to tell me what it stands for, aren't you? executable linkable format for those on the stream. Now we know. Um, a vulnerability is a bug introduced by a programmer um, that can be leveraged by an exploit. Um, this is different from just a bug because if you have like a pointer that cra that isn't, uh, that's dereferenced, that's null, something like that, uh, it doesn't really cause an exploit. Whereas a vulnerability is things like buffer overflows, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, an exploit is crafted data that you send at a program to use this vulnerability or take advantage of this vulnerability, hence binary exploitation. Uh, the stack is an area of memory for variables declared directly in code. These are things like integers or um, like static strings, stuff like that. Whereas the heap is the area of memory for variables that are dynamically allocated. So when you do like a malloc or a calloc or a realloc, uh, that is uh, where it gets stored. So. Yeah. Um, a register is very fast storage that sits right on the CPU. Um, this is basically how programs access data without having to go into memory. Uh, there's also caches which store like frequently used data closer to the CPU because like if you ever looked at a motherboard, the further away from the processor you get, uh, the slower it takes to actually get stuff from that other hardware. Finally, EIP stands for Extended Instruction Pointer. That's a special register that stores the next um, address in uh, the code for the next instruction to run. And I'm going to talk a bunch, say a bunch of technical terms. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me um, if anything's going over your head. So what are some examples? I already gave some examples of vulnerabilities, but do you guys have other ones that you know? Feel free to just shout them out. Yeah, that's a buffer overflow. Okay, yeah, Micah. Yeah. What? Yeah. That, that's more what I'm looking for. Okay. I was considering skipping the slide, and it turns out I should have, because I didn't really structure it well. So buffer overflow is like the most common vulnerability that you can introduce in code, especially in C. Because uh, C lets you do basically whatever you want. Uh, it will give you the gun and load it and let you point it at your foot and then fire it. Um, <laughs> so the clinical definition is when you read or write past the bounds of a memory structure. Uh, that's some example code. Basically, you can see there is a buffer that's 15 uh, bytes in length. And you do it gets without actually like worrying about what's getting pulled in. Um, and it will print it out. So I actually wrote that into a program, oh, I got everything open up there. That's OK. I'll move the VM up there while we're doing this, too. <sighs> Actually, it would be easier if I just shared my screen so I can see what I'm typing. I'm going to do that instead. I apologize for the disorganized nature of this presentation. I finished it this morning. Just give me one second while I change my display settings to mirror my display. There we go. That's much better. All right. So 
Same program. I already uh, compiled it. If you run it, it goes, it, and I actually realized this because this is a Mac. Uh, the Mac compiler will tell you when it's unsafe. What? Yeah. How's that? Is that a little better? OK. Thank you. Like I said, I haven't really done mirroring before. I usually share my, or uh, usually do a second screen. Um, so we can enter whatever data we want. Let's enter, hello, and then it prints it out, and it's perfectly fine. But what if we were like this? What if we were screaming about how we have too much work or whatever, and then an H? It aborts. That would look like, um, if you're running it on Linux, that would say segmentation fault uh, because you overran the um, memory for this structure. So let's switch back to the presentation. The reason why this happens is because this is what actually gets allocated in memory when you run a program. Um, you have on the left here the uh, program itself. So command line arguments and environment variables get put at the very high end of memory. Then each function that gets called allocates its own stack frame, which basically holds everything on this side. Parameters called for the function, the return address for the function, uh, the previous value for the frame pointer, stuff like that. Um, so this is where it's important because uh, this stack function contains all of your, or this stack frame contains all variables related to that function. Um, and obviously main, which is the function get, that gets called when the program starts, uh, has its own stack or frame. Um, so if you start allocating a bunch of stuff, you eventually, or if you end up using a bunch of memory, you will end up running into the parameters and potentially the return address. Wow, that's crazy. I wonder if we could do anything with that. So the first step when you get into doing binary exploitation is fuzzing. Basically, you just uh, take what we were doing before, typing a bunch of A's and making it programmatic. Um, so increasing the amount of stuff that you send into the buffer until you see a crash. And then keeping track of, OK, this was the length of all of that data. Um, now I know how much data I have to send to get, to it, to get it to crash. Um, our goal is going to be to control the instruction pointer so that we can like run our own type of code. Maybe other registers too. So I'm going to do a demo of this part. I have this VM over here. Um, all of these demos are based on the Voln server, which is a program um, that some dude on the internet wrote in order to specifically test uh, this type of exploit. So if I execute that, it just starts, it says it's vulnerable, um, and it listens on port 9999 for any incoming connections. So before I actually start doing anything, let's see. I don't remember my IP address, so I'll do this once. 136.189. What it looks like when you connect. You can run a whole bunch of different commands. The command that we're going to target is the trun command, which these just don't really do anything. It just continues to print that stuff out if it's a valid um, data. But this uh, command is vulnerable to a buffer overflow, which we will see momentarily. So I wrote all of my code for this beforehand so that I wouldn't like mess up during my own uh, demo. And this is what the fuzzing uh, one looks like. Also, uh, yeah. So the way it works is that I'm just going to try to send different um, lengths of the buffer over the socket to uh, the program until it eventually crashes. That's why it's in a try except. So let me source my, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Let me source my um, pi in, er, my virtual environment and then run fuzz.py. And I want to point it at what that IP was, 136.189. So it runs. And we can see that there isn't really anything vulnerable with that. So let's try to increase the length. And we'll do it by, yeah, we'll do it by hundreds. It's pretty quick. Oh. 
it crashed. If we switch back over to the VM, you'll see that the program closed. You don't see anything there anymore. I'm going to open it again because I'm probably going to be doing stuff with it a little bit later. Um, yeah. So pretty simple. You can just write a Python script and get it working. So we have a crash. Now what do we want to do? We want to debug the program so that we can see what the state of the program is when it crashes. Because we don't really, can't really do anything if you don't know what's going on. Can't write an exploit for that. Um, so we're going to see what changes with the registers, especially the stack and base pointers, which are other um, registers that keep track of the state of the stack um, so that we can do some malicious stuff. So there's a cool program called Immunity Debugger that you can install on your computer box to do debugging in Windows. I'm going to run that in the background here. Um, let's see if I can resize this, because this is like super big. I was going to say, I hope it doesn't stay that way. Eh, all right, it didn't really help. That's OK. Learn by doing. So if you open a Unity debugger, you can attach to running processes. You'll see that I have the Volm server right there. And now you can see the entire state of the program right now. Over here is a view of what the assembly looks like for the program. Um, if you look to the right, these are what the registers look like. Um, this is the uh, current state of the stack. You can see that based on the register values up here. Um, and this is just a dump of stuff within memory that you can uh, move around in. So if we run our fuzzer again, oh, it's paused. That will happen when you start the debugger. OK, and then it actually went through. You'll see what actually happened. EIP gets overwritten with a bunch of uh, crap. So that's how we know. Um, oh, actually not EIP. It tries to do a store byte from EDI, which is equal to all that stuff. So obviously, that's not a real um, address in memory. So it fails to do the instruction. That's why it crashes. Um, when we start doing stuff, that was just kind of a fluke of the demo. Um, I think it's because it, I uh, started the fuzzer before I resumed it. Um, EIP gets overwritten with that stuff. So actually, it's pretty easy to do. I'll just do this really quickly. You guys see this a lot, me restarting, hitting the play button twice. If we run this again, now you'll see, oh, the same thing, whatever. <laughs> per usual, demo gods are not in my favor. Uh, it's not working correctly, but that's OK. I assure you that we will be overwriting EIP very soon. So let's switch back over here. Now we know what registers we're overwriting. Next, we need to know what parts of the buffer end up where. Um, normally, we would also test to see if any characters get formatted out by the command processor. So like when you hit Enter or uh, yeah, actually, perfect example. When you hit Enter, that corresponds to like a um, ASCII character. And if that ends up getting into your shell code, um, which is code that you have execute when the exploit happens, um, it's going to get pulled out and your exploit's going to break. Um, but I know that there aren't any in there like that, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, we're going to use two tools in Metasploit called pattern underscore create dot RB and then offset. Uh, Metasploit comes with a couple of tools that make binary uh, or that make exploit writing a little easier. These programs create a pattern of text that is um, like iterative. So there's a bunch of symbols that get printed out, and then you can use that in place of the buffer that we uh, in place of like the A's or the I's that we were sending to the program at first to see how far into your string um, you have to get in order to start changing registers, which is really important because um, we're eventually going to have to jump to our shell code. And you need to know where in your buffer to put that instruction or memory address. So the way that we do that is with another script. This one's called narrow.py. This is a lot easier. Um, oh, I know why this looks like this. So, Instead of having iterative stuff, we're just going to have an IP and a port that you use to connect to it. Um, we have this connection. It looks like the script is over. But then if I hit the down key, you'll see that this is the text that goes into the buffer. Uh, whole lot of text, because you don't know how long of a buffer. Or we know that it takes up to 2,000 characters to crash the script. So we need to create 2,000, a at least 2,000 character long string um, in order to 
correctly identify where in that string we're going to put our shell code and our address. And then the rest that shows up is just we sent that string and we print out that the payload was sent. So I'm going to clear this again. This time we're going to run narrow.py. I'm going to quickly check that this is actually running. No, it's not. That's why we check this. And I actually make it run. We do that. Now if we switch over here, you can see that EIP has been overwritten with like a bunch of garbage. So if we switch back over here and we do pattern offset.rb for, oh, it's not that value. That's the EBP one. Eh, we'll do it with EIP. If we put the value that's in here into this program, which is 396F4338, three, 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 it will run for a second and tell me that I don't have a thing installed. If it was properly installed, it would print out exactly where into the string that uh, value was found, which in our case, I'll cheat and look at the next script, which is, I think I actually exploit that pie. Um, you'll see it's 2006. That's how far in uh, we have to get to um, change our execution. All right. So now we control the instruction pointer. This is great. What do we do next? Um, we can put arbitrary content on the stack, which is what I said before the uh, ESP register points to. So now let's change execution so that we can point at the stack. This takes two steps. Uh, first, we're going to overwrite EIP with an address in the program that already does this so that the program will jump to that part of code and then run that instruction. Um, then we're going to put code that executes malicious stuff into ESP. It's the shell code that I was talking about before. Um, you'll see it in a little bit, but this program is really simple. It doesn't have data execution prevention or turned on or ASLR, which like randomizes the address space of the program, which would defeat, both of those would defeat this um, because you wouldn't be able to execute anything on the stack and we wouldn't be able to find an address that uh, we can reliably jump to. Uh, but th those are a little advanced and there are ways around those Maybe we'll give a talk on that in the future. Who knows? So the way we're going to do this is with two tools. The first one is mona.py, which is a pi command for immunity debugger. Think of it like an extension. Um, this allows us to look through all of the modules that are currently loaded in the program and then also find a string within the program um, to look for. it. Uh, what we're going to look for is the hex that corresponds to the instruction jump ESP which is how we're going to actually end up executing our shell code. Um, yeah. The other thing we're going to use is MSF Venom. This is another Metasploit tool that allows you to automatically generate shell code for various platforms and payloads. Um, this, you can write your own shell code, and at certain stages of like advanced um, binary exploitation, you probably are going to do that. Um, but we're not an APT. I'm just a guy with a laptop, so I'm going to use MSF Venom. Um, it also supports a bunch of different features, but we're just going to use the interpreter payload, which is a very basic payload. Um, if I had antivirus installed, cool. I forgot to turn on do not disturb. Now it's on. Um, if I had antivirus turned on, it would get picked up really quickly because the signature for interpreter is like a huge red flag obvious thing for antivirus to alert on. So let's bring it all together. We're going to restart the Vuln server. Going to resume it. And we're going to run Mona modules right in this uh, command field. So we can see that there are a bunch of things loaded, and specifically the Vuln server and the ESS func um, library file are running in code and have none of the normal uh, security protections against them. So they're perfect candidates for what we're looking for. Um, next, we're going to run find-s ffe4, which is the hex for jump ESP. 3-4. Thank you. That would have that would have not worked. In the ESS, actually we'll do it in vulnserver.exe. So it runs. Can't find anything. So let's try ESSFunk.dll instead. If 
found a whole bunch of stuff. That's great. So let's just use the first result for our exploit. Um, so now that we have that done, we'll jump over here and look at the script. I wrote all this stuff beforehand, but I will run the MSF Venom um, script for you in advance. In advance. So what we're going to do is select the Windows Meterpreter reverse TCP payload, which is going to connect back to our running Metasploit session. And then um, that will send back an additional stage of shellcode, which will be the actual meterpreter executable. We're going to be listening on uh, the gateway IP for the NAT, um, the NAT device for VMware. And exit func equal thre equals thread is a parameter that tells it to run this in a thread. Um, the other option you could do is have it run in a process. But if you do that, the process will close after you end your meterpreter session which is like super obvious. So we don't want to do that. Uh, the other stuff is what I was talking about before. I was uh, troubleshooting this like an hour ago. And for some reason, I had to use the encoder Shikata Ganai, which is like a built-in decoder in MSF Venom that does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it used to work to get around um, antivirus. But as antivirus has gotten more um, complex, it doesn't work anymore. Um, and B just tells it, don't use the D7 bad character. Uh, that corresponds to the EBX register, which gets filled with crap. So we don't want it to try to do that within the shell code, otherwise it'll crash. So if I hit enter, it'll take a minute to, to generate all this stuff. And there you have it. So this is a slightly different version of the shell code that I ended up using in here. Um, one of the problems with MSF Venom that's like a trade-off of having to get it, your shellcode generated is that sometimes it just won't work. Something won't write correctly. Uh, the, obviously, because it's generating shellcode, it doesn't know about the state of the program. So it's going to potentially use registers that could be in use by the program before, and it'll just go, eh, didn't work. Um, so you just got to keep trying, troubleshoot, put in a bad character for B7 so it doesn't try to use that register, stuff like that. So I copied and pasted this code into my exploit um, right here. So the way that we're going to craft the string is first we're going to send 2,006 I characters. That's going to trigger the overflow. Then we're going to send four hex bytes. This corresponds to the address that we found within Immunity Debugger, 625011AF. In just computers in general, this is a really fun anecdote. Um, Numbers are sometimes organized differently. They're either little endian or big endian. This comes from Gulliver's Travels. Travelers, yeah, Gulliver's Travels, um, a book written in like the 1800s, um, where this guy Gulliver goes around to a whole bunch of like uh, sails the seven seas and goes to one island where each side of the populace were diametrically opposed just because the way that they cracked their eggs on the little end or the big end. Some computer scientist somewhere, I guess, really liked it. And that's how we uh, refer to the way that numbers are organized. So 625011AF has to get sent in the opposite order because processors are uh, big endian, whereas the program itself is little endian. It's kind of confusing, and I may have actually said the wrong order there. But, the point of the, but that is the reason why we have to order it in a weird way and very easy to trip up on. So the next part of our string is a bunch of no operations. Uh, this allows it to have some room just in case. Um, I do this just out of like sheer, um, what's the word? Paranoia. Paranoia. That's the perfect word. Thank you. Exactly. Sometimes. Uh, just to repeat what Brad said in case you didn't hear and for the stream. Uh, sometimes like the program name, different things get stored on the stack. And you need to overwrite that such because otherwise uh, when execution jumps to the stack, it'll try to execute the program name and crash because that's just a bunch of garbage. Um, or even worse, it'll do stuff in a weird way that kind of breaks your exploit but doesn't. You don't want that either. So this allows you to have some room to work with. Then we throw the shell code onto the stack which connects back to us, like I explained. And then I send an additional bunch of, oh, that's hard to see. 
put it in. ZZ? ZZ? Yep. Thank you. Is that a little better? Perfect. Thank you, guys. So the tail, um, that's just something that I did because the exploit was not working for whatever reason. That's a really fun part of binary exploitation. Sometimes things just isn't going to work, and you've got to try new things. Um, so I put a bunch of A's on the end. Uh, then I put together the buffer and send it over the connection. Everything works. So I'm going to close out of this code and start Metasploit so that we can actually run this stuff. I'm going to deactivate the Python a virtual environment. I was trying to do this all in Python 3 to be you know, future focused. Um, but for some reason, it was encoding my uh, byte string incorrectly. So I had to switch back to Python 2 where you can just do whatever you want. Send a bunch of stuff into a string, and it works. So <clears throat> we're going to use the multi-handler exploit. This is a thing in Metasploit that just allows you to go, hey, throw whatever you want at me. I will respond and give you a session. We're going to use, um, you have to use the right, uh, set the right payload, which corresponds to what it was in Venom. So we set the payload equal to meterpreter slash reverse underscore TCP. We do show options. You can see that there's a whole bunch of stuff that you got to do as well. I'll do enter so you, everybody in the back can see that. We're going to set the uh, exit func setting to thread. And we're going to set the listening host to 192.168.136.1. Port's the same. That's the default port. Then you do exploit. Again, I'll hit enter a bunch. Actually, that's not going to help. Do exploit. And it's below the computers, but it says started TCP handler on the IP in the port. So if we switch back over here to make sure this is still running, cool, it is. We can do python exploit.py. I'm going to do it wrong because I forgot to type the IP. And we get connection refused. Interesting. Let's restart this just in case. It's possible either the firewall turned itself on. I also have to turn off a little snitch for a minute. Cool. Why is this breaking? This is my favorite part about doing um, things on the fly. Stuff stops working. Ah, yeah. Windows Defender wanted to protect me by turning on my firewall. But we like to live on the edge, so I'm going to turn that off. I like how it worked for literally the first half of the demo. And then suddenly, Windows was like, nah, we're going to turn this on for you. You've got to be more secure. Ironically, it was kind of the perfect time, because this is the actual exploit part. Did I miss one? Cool. This is perfect. Cool. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> I love it. Big fan. All right, your device may be vulnerable. Don't turn off your firewall, kids. And I also accidentally closed immunity, so I'm just going to open Vuln Server directly. Let's try it again. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yes, it is. Everything is off. It's actually listening. Let's check if the IP actually changed. That would make sense. 36. Oh, I did dot one. It's 189. <laughs> Dummy. There we go. Payload sent. We get a interpreter session. It actually works. Despite <laughs> my intense amounts of incompetence. But now I'm a hacker, and you can be too, even if you mistype a bunch of stuff and type the wrong IP in. So that's the demo. Here are a couple of resources I used. I pulled basically all of the um, terms out of the first lecture slide for RPI's binary exploitation um, course that they did a couple years back. That's a really cool resource to try to learn some of this stuff. Um, RPISEC basic, basically wrote the entire um, curriculum. And then they also have a VM that basically acts like a CTF type challenge where you have to um, exploit different levels that correspond to the curriculum. It's super cool. Um, I also took a bunch of the code from uh, Professor Olson's writing your first exploit repo on GitHub. Go take a look at it there. The code is very similar except for the shellcode. 
You guys have any questions? Simon. Yeah. That is a fantastic question. Um, so in pen testing, if you find something that you think is vulnerable that you're going to write an exploit for, you're going to want to download it, try to get a copy of the software that is both obviously the same software, same type, and the same version of it. This sounds kind of complicated, but think about how like HTTP works, for instance, Apache. Um, in normal Apache, it will tell you the exact version number of the server um, unless you change a directive in the configuration file. A lot of services work this way. So it's not that difficult. Um, so yeah, you would download it onto a box that you have, set up a lab environment, and then start working against the exploit. It's a great question, Simon. Cool. I may go to that. <laughs> thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>